We're in lesson six in our study of the church, which uh, technically is called ecclesiology, the doctrine of the church, um, dealing here with divinely given names. Question number one, would it surprise you to learn that the church has no one official name? In fact, there are several designations in the New Testament for the church and for those who are members of the church. However, Names are very important for the church as they are for each one of us individually. What rationale may be given for some of the designations for the church in the New Testament? What rationale? Sometimes the, the designation of the church helps you know where it's located. Sometimes it's uh, to designate uh, what uh, the church believes. If I were to go into a town and I would see several buildings that had, were all identified by a church, I would not only realize that this is a place where people who call themselves Christians assemble, but I'd have a pretty good idea of probably what's going on in that church because I know about the differences that there are by the different designations we give to churches. Now, I think that some designations are most unappropriate, but I think that many designations are very appropriate. So we're here to discuss that general area in our class today. Uh, I think the church is called the Church of God. In fact, more frequently, well, the most frequently word of the church in the New Testament is just the word church, without any other designation. Next to that is the Church of God. That may surprise a lot of people, but uh, when you actually count how many times the church is referred to in a designated way, the Church of God will come in number one. But there are other designations that uh, people prefer. Uh, it's called the Church of the Firstborn Ones. It's called the Church of the Saints. It's called, plurally, Churches of Christ. Uh, now, the word number two, not, the word church is not a name. Some have suggested that since the church is the bride of Christ, she ought to wear the name of Christ and be called the Church of Christ. However, Christ is not a name. Jesus is his name. Christ is his title. It designates the office that he holds. The word Christ is the same as the word Messiah. It's a designation like the word Lord. It is therefore, is it therefore wrong to speak of the church as the Church of Christ? The answer is obviously no, it's not wrong. In fact, in Romans 16, 16, the Bible uses that term in the plural form, where Paul concludes with this word, greet one another with a holy kiss, all the churches of Christ greet you. Uh, during my years of living in the St. Louis area, I became a good friend of uh, Carl Ketcherside. He was a member of the Non-Instrumental Church of Christ, a dynamic preacher. I heard him preach many times. I invited him to speak on our campus to our students. Uh, never once was I ever disappointed in his preaching. He put out a little uh, monthly paper. Uh, if I recall correctly, it's called The Christian Messenger. And in that Christian Messenger, he always had thought-provoking material. And so I, I was blessed by his insight. He'd report news of the churches and so on. Uh, I copied down one of the things that he wrote with regard to this particular question I've just asked. Um, a person wrote to uh, Carl Ketcherside, and uh, he said in his letter, I do not agree with you and your idea about the name of the church. The church is the bride of Christ, and the bride ought to wear the name of the husband. I would not want my wife to wear some other name other than mine. He responded, I can sympathize with one who uses such loose reasoning, for I used to engage in it before I had learned better. There are two things wrong with my brother's views. This is Carl Ketcher's side. Uh, answering this fellow took issue with him and he said there are two things wrong with his views in the first place they're unscriptural 
And in the second place, he doesn't practice what he preaches. Well, he's being pretty blunt, isn't he? <laughs> I can prove both charges. Number one, the idea that a wife should bear her husband's name as he means it is not a scriptural one. No married woman in Bible times was ever called by her husband's name. That practice is a fairly modern one. Uh, and women uh, were their own names uh, in the Bible days. Sarah, Abraham's wife, Zacharias, and his wife Elizabeth. Uh, the word church is not a name at all. It is a common noun like house or wife. But my brother doesn't believe that what he argues, and to prove it, I will put him to the test. He believes the expression, the church of Christ, is the bride wearing the name of her husband. He wants to see that the name over the door where he worships is church of Christ. I have sad news for him. The word Christ is not a name of our Lord at all. It's his office. Christ is no more his name than is the word Lord. The word Christ is merely the Greek form of the Hebrew Messiah. It isn't a name at all, it's an office which God made him to occupy. The brother who wrote is a janitor for a school. He says, I would not want my wife wearing another name than mine. Well, he would not want her to be called Mrs. Janitor. Now, if he is consistent, he would demand that they repaint the sign on their building to read Church of Jesus. He must either do that or admit that his argument is worthless. I predict he will do neither. <laughs> it's an interesting way to uh, evaluate some of our uh, own opinions and the strength that we have behind the opinions that we've probably not really thought through. Bottom line is there is no one name singled out in the scripture that indicates that this is the name of the church, the body of Christ. Uh, question number three. In what way do names describe or designate? Uh, I've grown up realizing that uh, sometimes it takes a while to learn what a person's real name is. I had two friends. One was called Skinny, and the other was called Shorty. And that was the name, not the name of either one. Uh, I looked, later on learned that uh, uh, Shorty, I can't even remember his name, real name now, but the real name of Skinny was Glenn. And I know why that each one of those boys had that name. Because when you looked at them, one was pretty skinny and the other was kind of chubby. Uh, I remember when children used to be kind of not very happy about being called Freck because they had so many freckles. Oh. But how are you going to get away from that? <clears throat> and I had another friend who was called Red simply because that was the color of his hair. And sometimes we hear all these names. Now, is there something behind these names? Well, yes, there is. There's something about a person that may cause us to say, hey, Fatso, how you doing? That would not be something you want to do if you want to remain friendly with a person. But uh, there is something about people that does uh, call forth a name. <clears throat> now, um, in what way are names distinguished? Well, um, in the second chapter of the book of Genesis, uh, God made not only man, but he made the beasts and the birds and all everything else. And one of uh, man's responsibility was, way back in the beginning, is to give a name. Now, I don't know where, how Noah, uh, Adam rather, came up with all these names. But uh, at least that's the names that we stick with today. And we distinguish between one animal and another animal by the name that's given to that animal. Or that bird. I remember when I was in the Boy Scouts, I had to, in order to get one of my merit badges, had to be able to identify at least 50 different birds by sight. And uh, 
So that meant I had to come up with 50 different names and put the name of that bird identical with the proper bird. Well, I, there are a lot of names, but it serves as a designation, and uh, <coughs> names distinguish every one of us. We all have an individual name, and if you have identically the same name as somebody else, pray tell they don't ever get hold of your checkbook, or you may be in trouble. <laughs> so we know in a number of different ways that names are important, and that the name we have belongs to us. Number five, uh, do names aid the memory? Yes. Yes, they do. Uh, you remember that David and Bathsheba had a son, and they gave their son the name what? The first one or Solomon? The one that was so wise. Solomon. Yes. One day, Nathan the prophet came and visited them and said, uh, congratulations on your son. You might be interested to know that God has chosen to give him a different name. What was that name? Oh boy. Josiah has a brother who has the same name. Jedediah. Jedediah. And why did Nathan give the name uh, Jedediah to Solomon? Well, he represents God. Nathan did. He's a prophet of God. And the word Jedediah means beloved of God. And so God wanted uh, David and Bathsheba to know your son is somebody I really love. And I just, that's what I'm going to call it. Uh, a good name. And uh, names are changed for a purpose, for a reason. Um, one of the things, one of the names of uh, churches in the past that you don't see much anymore. Have you ever seen a, an old country church that was called Ebenezer Church? Yeah. Yeah, why would it be called Ebenezer? I mean, who uses the word Ebenezer today? What does Ebenezer mean? Well, that's exactly why they call it the Ebenezer Church. Oh. The word Ebenezer was a word that was used to designate a place where God had given his people a victory. And that came to be known as Stone of Hell. And so this church is called the Ebenezer, whatever else they may have had with that name, the Ebenezer Church which is this is the church where God is there to give us help. That, that's kind of interesting. And uh, now people going down the street that don't know the meaning of that word won't understand why it's used. Uh, there's a hymn we used to sing that has the word Ebenezer in it. And uh, I've often wondered how many times we sing hymns or songs, even today, that have certain words in there and we stop and ask, wait a minute, what, what are you just saying? I have, some, I have trouble with some of the courses I hear sung here. But I think, wait a minute. Uh, now this is just me. Don't, you don't have to agree with me. But uh, I've never pictured Jesus running out of the tomb. I just, I cannot visualize that at all. But that's what the song says. And do people believe what they say? Well, a lot of people do. Uh, this is one of the reasons why uh, I'm really concerned about pictures of Jesus. How do you picture somebody you don't really know? You know, and we all have our different ideas. When I was uh, uh, younger and would participate in summer Christian camps with teenagers and junior high age groups, they would uh, put on dramas one night, have drama night, and they would uh, have a, uh, take a Bible story and act that Bible story out. <laughs> the one that I think I'll never forget is uh, the Bible story about beheading John the Baptist. And uh, the way they visualize that is, of course, they had the curtains pulled. And when they opened the curtains, there was the table, and uh, uh, there was a uh, a cloth over the table, but directly they, uh, when they came to the appropriate time of the story, they removed that cloth and there was a man's head. <laughs> well, the person was down below the table, you know, and they uh, had this kind of table fixed where it come apart, and this one head was up there, and I thought, wow, we're really getting graphic, aren't we? Uh, but the issue was, many times, uh, should we uh, really try to betray Christ? 
portray Christ, I should say. And uh, I don't think we ever came to an agreement on that. People had their difference of opinion. Uh, sometimes we just chose to use uh, Bible stories where we don't, did not have to have any one individual try to pr portray Christ because who really can, you know? There's so much that we need to learn and so far to go to become more like Christ. But anyhow, uh, names do have uh, a significance and uh, we need to be concerned about uh, words and their use of them and whether they really convey the truth. But we're talking about names here. Do names ever indicate a process? Well, uh, in my own life, uh, I've gone through four name changes. At one time I was called son, then I was called father, then I was called grandpa, then I was called great grandpa. I don't know whether I'm gonna ever grow beyond that or not. Hopefully not, but uh, the Lord's certainly going to come before then. But we do go through changes, don't we? Uh -huh. And all these designations have a significance. That's the point I'm trying to make. Uh, every time you read a designation for the church in the Bible, there's a reason for that designation, biblically speaking. I'm not trying to justify all the various names that are used in our world today, but I'm talking about what does the Bible say about names and what can we learn from that. Uh, number seven, why are names important? I think uh, for two reasons. Number one, we would never learn very much if there was not some designation we could use for everything that we talk about. So we depend upon names for everything, all the time. We could not communicate intelligently without some kind of a designation. So that adds to our knowledge. And furthermore, the second thing that makes names so important is they identify. Now each one of you here today has a different name. And that identifies you as being different from everybody else. And yet all of us fall into one of two categories, either male or female. But can we make a further distinction? Yes. Because every one of us has a distinct name. Now there are other ways that we can make identification, but names do play an important role. Now, number eight is where you have to help me out here. If you've already worked this out, good for you, and if you haven't, uh, let's work it out together. Identify the importance attached to names in the New Testament by matching the following scriptures. So I'm gonna begin with number one, and uh, we gotta find out which of the letters in the alphabet uh, has appropriate uh, designation for uh, what is taught to us in Philippians chapter 2, uh, verses 9 through 11. I'll read that for you. For this reason also, God highly exalted him and bestowed upon him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow of things who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now, what fits that? C. 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 Letter what? C. C. You're exactly right. His name is to be above every name. That's important. Uh, number two, Acts 4.12. And there's salvation in no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. E. E. That's right. Letter E. Uh, number three, Acts 2.38, Peter said to them, Repent, and each one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. J. 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 J for Julie. That's right. J. All right, number four. What was that again? J. 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 It was J. All right. J for two. I guess. That would be. <laughs> <laughs> Number four. Um, John 14, and that's supposed to be verse 13. 14, 13. Whatsoever you ask in my name, that will I do, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. F. F is right. Number five. 
Colossians 3.17, Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks through Him to God the Father. Age. Age is correct. Uh, number six, Matthew 18.20, For where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there in their midst. D. D is right. Number seven. First Corinthians 1 Corinthians 1.13 Now I exhort you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all agree, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be made complete in the... Um, let me see where I am. In the same mind, in the uh, same judgment, for I have been informed concerning you, my brethren, by Chloe's people, that there are quarrels among you. Now I mean this, that each one of you is saying, I'm of Paul, I'm of Paulus, I'm of Cephas, I'm of Christ. Has Christ been divided? Was, was not, Paul was not crucified for you, was he? Or were you baptized in his name? G, G is right. Amen. Number eight, Revelation chapter 22 and verse 44 and 5. They will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads. B. B. Number nine is Acts chapter 11, verse 26. When he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. And for an entire year, they met with the church and taught considerable numbers and the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. A. A is correct. You all ought to get the last one right. <laughs> John 17, 12, while I was with them, I was keeping them in your name, which you have given me, and I guarded them, and not one of them perished, but the son of perdition, so that the scriptures would be fulfilled. A, A is correct. All right, number nine. What three ways do we have of expressing ownership in the English language. Well, there are three ways. Um, we can talk about uh, the preposition of, uh, or we can add the suffix I-A-N on the end of a word, or we can use an apostrophe and S on the end of a word. So we can say the philosophy of Plato, or the Platonian philosophy or Plato's philosophy. Three different ways are showing the same thing. Likewise, we may say the Church of Christ or Christian Church or Christ Church. This makes sense? Mm -hmm. You use of, I-A-N, or the apostrophe S. Now, another matching here. Number 10, identify the following names with the appropriate scripture. <clears throat> Acts chapter 20, verse 28 reads, Be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. D. D. Question number two. 1 Timothy 3.15, but in the case I am in case I am delayed, I write so that you will know how one ought to conduct himself in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and support of the truth. G. G. Romans 16.16. 16. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the churches of Christ greet you. A. Which one? A. A. That's right. 1 Corinthians 14, 33, For God is not the God of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. E. E. 1 Thessalonians 1, 1, Paul and Silvanus and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians in, of God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace. A. H. H. Revelation 3.14, to the angel of the church in Laodicea write, 
the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God says this. E. E? E. I thought he was born. Yeah, we did, didn't we? I made a mistake myself. Where are we? He says, well, I'll see ends. So that would be, that's the only season where it mentions it. <clears throat> Hebrews 12, 23. To the general assembly and the church of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven and to God, the judge of all and to the saints, and of the righteous made perfect. B. B. Okay. Number 11. Identify the Ill illustrative terms given to the church with the appropriate scripture. Uh, number one is 1 Corinthians 14.27. Now you who are Christ's body and individually members of it. See. See. Colossians 4.11 And also Jesus who is called justice. These are the only fellow workers for the kingdom of God who are from the circumcision and they have proved to be an encouragement to me. <coughs> 1 Corinthians 3.16 and 17 Do you not know that you are a temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you. If any man destroys the temple of God, God will destroy him. Yes. Yeah. All right. Ephesians 2.21, in whom the whole building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple. Two twenty-one and 22 in whom the whole building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple of the Lord in whom you also being built together into a dwelling of God the Spirit Timothy 3.15, but in the case I am delayed, I write so that you will know how one ought to conduct himself in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and support of the truth. That's right. That's indeed. <coughs> Ephesians 2.19, so then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with saints and are of God's household. Acts 20, verses 28 and 29, be on your guard for yourselves, for all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to shepherd the church of God which he has purchased with his own blood. I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, uh, not sparing the flock. E. E. That's for number seven. 
And Colossians 1.13, for he rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. H. 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 Very good. Now, number 12, the name Christian, there shouldn't be an S there, the name Christian appears three times in the New Testament. How is it used each time? Um, let me read this to you. In Acts 11.26, when he had found them, he brought him to Antioch, and for an entire year they met with the church and taught considerable numbers, and the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. Now, this indicates where the name first was used. The first time the designation Christian was given was in Antioch. Now, there's more than one Antioch. This is Antioch of Syria. Syria is the same place today as it was in Bible days, vice versa. That's the church that sent out Paul and Barnabas on their missionary journeys. Acts 26, 28, Agrippa replied to Paul, in a short time, you will persuade me to become a Christian? And here the word Christian is referring to, well, I know who you are. I know what you want me to be. Are you expecting me to be like that? So it's a designation to refer to a people that were distinguished by this name. First uh, Peter chapter 4 and verse 16, but if anyone suffers as a Christian, he is not to be ashamed, but is to glorify God in the name. Now, what we learn in these three passages of Scripture is that the word Christian was a divinely given name. That's what the word called means in the 11th chapter of the book of Acts where we first read about this. Then when Paul is witnessing before King Agrippa, the word name had become firmly established and recognized that those who were called Christians were those who followed the Lord Jesus Christ. And Agrippa is saying, are you trying to persuade me to be a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ? And then the passage in Peter, the name is used to say, now if you have this name, expect to have what kind of an experience? Suffering. It's not going to be easy. So the three times it's used, there's a definite distinction. It's a divinely given name. It's a name which identifies those who follow the Lord. And it's a name that describes the people who follow the Lord as ones who are willing to suffer for their faith and their allegiance to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, are you ready for one more matching? I don't, I don't know why I put all these matching in one lesson, but I, I did, and so we'll see how we do here. Um, I, I think I'm going to, um, I'm going to read uh, the scripture again, and you tell me which one it fits. We'll start up here with letter A. Uh, you are our letter written on our hearts, known and read by all men. Eight. Oh, eight. 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 That's correct. Third John, fourteen and fifteen. I hope to see you shortly, and we will speak face to face. Peace be to you, the friends greet you, greet the friends by name. <coughs> Romans 8, 33. Who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Five. 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 Ephesians 6, 23. Peace be to the brethren and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Two. Two. Acts 9.26 When he came to Jerusalem, he was trying to associate with the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, not believing that he was a disciple. E. One. That's right. 1 Peter 2.5, you also as living stones are being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Right. Ephesians 5.1, therefore be imitators of God as beloved children. Three, four, four, four. 
Beloved, this is Jude 3, Beloved, while I was making every effort to write you about our common salvation, I felt the necessity to write to you appealing that you contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all handed down to the saints. Three is correct. Now number 14, which of the above terms describes Christians as learners? Eight. Well, I don't want to, I don't need a number here, I need a word. Oh. You didn't do Jude. Letters and epistles. I'm on question number 14. Oh, okay, well I'm out in left field then. <laughs> I'm just asking which of the above terms. Oh. We've already talked about all these terms. You've got disciple, brethren, saints, children, elect, chosen, friends, stones, letters, epistles. Now of all those terms, which one of these terms describes Christians as learners? Disciples. Disciples. Oh, okay. That's what the word disciple means. That should be an easy one for us to remember. Uh, what word is like disciple that helps us to understand what disciple means? Discipline. Ah. What is the purpose of discipline? Is that not to teach? Yes. Yeah, we want people to learn something here. All right, number 15. Which of the above terms describes the Christian's character? Saints. Saints. Saint. Oh. Do you not think that's the reason why we don't use that word for often? <laughs> it's a pretty high mark for us to fit into, isn't it? But we all are. Now. But we all are saints. We really are. Number 16, which of the above terms describes the Christian as a witness? Brethren. What? Brethren. The elect and chosen. Epistles. Disciples. How about stones? How about letters? Well, okay. good. <laughs> Have you ever written a letter and witnessed to somebody by writing something down and giving it to them? Oh. Do we not use a written word to share with other people? Do we not turn to the epistles of the New Testament and say we need to read this to learn how to become a Christian? So we witness through what we write and share with others. Number 17. What is the most common reference to the church in the New Testament? Brethren. What is the most common oh. word that Speaks of the church. Don't make this harder than it is. What is the most common used word to describe or to talk about the church? What is the most important word? What is the one that's used more frequently than any other word to let you know we're talking about the church? Friends. I'm going to go home. <laughs> Nobody's learning. <laughs> it's the word church. That's what I said at the very beginning of our class. It's the word church. I know it's not. That's what I said before. You're supposed to read my mind, don't you know? Ah. Uh, I'm not so sure I'm glad I came today, but anyhow, I'm having a lot of fun. I don't know about you. All right, number 18. What is the second most common reference to the church in the New Testament? What is the second most common term used in the Bible, speaking of the church? Well, go above the list. I mean, I've given you several lists, so you don't don't just stop oh, with one list. Kingdom. The elect. Church of Christ. What does it start with? What's the first letter? <laughs> the first word is the word church. What's the next? What's the next two words? Church of, Church of God. Oh. I said that? Didn't, didn't I say that earlier? Yes, you did. And question number... Now you go home and look at this again. And see if I... Check me out if I'm do, doing some double talk here. <laughs> All right, number 19. 
Is the name Christian a name of distinction and possession? Yes. yes. Boy, it certainly is. It distinguishes us from those who are not Christians, and it speaks of us as belonging to God. We're His property. We are disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. And further, it's a name that uh, identifies the family we're in. It's a Christian family. It's a, a part of the family of the Lord, the founder of the church, the author of the gospel. Number 20, how does Exodus 27 underscore God's concern for his name? Let me read Exodus 27. Uh, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not leave him unpunished who takes his name in vain. Now, taking the name of the Lord in vain means at least three things. It means to use God's name to back up a lie. It means to use God's name as an idle, useless, flippant, irreverent utterance. It means to use God's name for a wicked purpose, for blasphemy, and anything like that. Now, a person's name is closely associated with the person who bears it. Thus, to use a name wrongly is to use the person wrongly. So, all of this is simply to point out that there is no one specific designation for us as individuals or for the body of people as, in, as a group, but that there are several ways in which we are identified, all of which have a definite meaning and definite purpose and a valid description and identity. But uh, it also becomes uh, a guideline for us not to go beyond what the scriptures have to say with regard to the names that we use. I, uh, I, I, think it's, uh, I think that Christians ought never to shy away from letting other people realize that they are a Christian. I don't think we should try to hide our identity. And I think that uh, our identity in the congregations where we assemble together uh, should be a clear uh, identity of who we really are. And uh, so there's a lot of leeway here, and there are a lot of things that we, in our religious community, they argue about which is best. And obviously, I think that some have greater value and greater meaning and, than others, and I think that some are really not as appropriate as they, I think they probably should be. All right, lesson seven. Are you ready for this? Always. I'm not sure I am. <laughs> We're going to talk about the Lord's Supper. What two terms are used today to describe the Lord's Supper that are not used in the New Testament? Communion. Well, I think there is a communion in the New Testament. Breakfast? A what? Breakfast. A breakfast? No, I've never heard that before. Well, my mother used to, when she'd go through communion, she'd break off a big, huge piece, and I used to go, Mom, it's not breakfast, it's just communion. Oh, I don't know that. That's interesting. It's a Jewish thing. On a more serious note. <laughs> There are two words that are popular in the religious world. One is the word ordinance, and the other is the word sacrament. Have you ever heard of either word? Sacrament, yeah. The Christian churches in the past have used the word ordinance very often. And other churches have continued to use the word sacrament pretty often. And. Uh, Neither one of these terms are used, to my knowledge, in the New Testament with regard to the Lord's Supper. Uh, let's deal with this a little bit. What is a church ordinance? Well, the word itself has to help us understand what it means. Uh, the first part of that word is order. So an ordinance is something that you've ordered in order to do. Can you understand why people would refer to the Lord's Supper as an ordinance of the Lord? Has he not instructed us to observe the Lord's Supper? I think that he has. Uh, 
an ordinance is something that we are obligated to uh, consider seriously and to follow correctly. Um, now, in the Christian church, many times the word ordinance has been used to refer to the Lord's Supper and Christian baptism. And how often I grew up hearing that there are two ordinances in the church, the Lord's Supper and Christian baptism. But I don't find any place in the Bible where it pairs those two together as being alike or that they are called ordinances. Now, are we supposed to do both of them? Well, yes, we are. But can you think of anything else in the Bible we're supposed to do? Are we not supposed to pray? Does not the Bible say pray without ceasing? Then why is that not called an ordinance? But it isn't. And that kind of bothered me. And so I, I shy away from that term. I understand what the word means, but uh, I think that when we try to put some things in a, a different kind of a setting than what they were intended in the beginning, we may do some damage along the way in mudding up what it really means. So uh, I, I shy away from using the word ordinance. But it's been out there, and you'll probably hear it. Visiting different churches, uh, well, this is one of the ordinances of the church. And people may ask you, if they come from a different church, what are your ordinances? Now, the other word that's used is the word sacrament. Now, I've never heard that word used in the Christian church, or the Church of Christ. But uh, it is used in the religious world uh, by more than one group. And the word sacrament simply means something sacred. Yeah. Well, is baptism sacred? Yes. Is the Lord's Supper sacred? Yes. Yes. Well, obviously it is. However, the term sacred came to be used in other ways in the early church. And the word itself can literally mean to take an oath. And by using it to take an oath, they've come up then with adding a lot of different things to the list of what are considered sacraments. Well, uh, for an example, uh, the sacraments in the uh, Catholic Church have gone to as many as 20 at one time in their history, and now I think it's down to seven. Uh, the last report I've heard is that they have what they call seven sacraments that they observe. Um, now, in discussing the Lord's Supper, I prefer to lay those aside because I think they kind of muddy the water as to what we're really talking about because they don't really fit the way people have made these words to appear. As I've already indicated with the word ordinance, which, which we've been guilty of in our past, uh, it may lead the wrong conclusion. I'll give you an example. Uh, I was a guest preacher for a church here in the state several years ago, and one of our students uh, was preaching at that church. And as we went through the morning service, we came to uh, the time that we were going to observe the Lord's Supper. And he made the comment that I've heard frequently. He said, we've now come to the most important part of our service. Now, which part of the service do you think he's talking about? The Lord's Supper. And so I went up to him and asked for him, so I said, uh, you, you, you've said something, and I, I just don't know where you got that. Can you show me in Scripture where, that's, where that is the most important part of our service? Well, he's taken back. I said, don't be embarrassed. I'm not, I'm not really trying to put you on the spot. But I said, let me ask you something. When you preach a sermon, do you think that's important? And if so, why? Why are you preaching a sermon? Well, I hope you're preaching the gospel. Why does anybody preach the gospel? Well, what is the gospel? Romans 1.16 says, the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. Is there anything in the world more important than bringing a person out of sin into a safe relationship with the Lord? 
And he said, well, I never thought about that. I said, well, uh, I'm not criticizing you, but I just kind of take it back by this is the most important part of our service. And I know what, I know what the intention is. This is a really important part. But what happens when we begin to say one, two, three, four? Yeah. You know, folks, everything about our Christian witness is important. And I, the thing that bothers me is we say, the thing that bothers me particularly, I don't know whether any of you have ever been in a situation like that or not, but I'm pretty old, so I go back a long ways. And it used to be that the communion service was always up in the early part of the service. And after the communion service was over, a bunch of people got up and left. Why? Because they'd done their duty. They did the most important thing. They didn't want to stay around and see the preacher preach a sermon. But that's all right, because they did the most important thing. And I think, I think they just muddied the waters when they get up and walk out of that. I mean, you just got through remembering what Christ has done for you. Don't, don't you want to hear more about what Christ has to say to us? Is that not what the Bible is teaching? And uh, it's just like uh, I was preaching for a church in central Illinois several years ago, and the preacher said, uh, I, I just want to say something to you. He said, this is embarrassing for me. But he said, uh, I, I think you need to know this. If some people get up and walk out on you, don't be offended because they're going to watch their watch and they want to be the first people in line in the cafeteria. <laughs> and they know if they leave at this particular time, they're going to make it. So if you go past the time, they'll walk out on you. Don't let that stop you. Everybody else is going to stay here. But there, they'll all be sitting together. That's what's going to happen. I said, well, I'm glad you told me. I don't like people walking out on me. So I'll just time my sermon. I'll Make sure that they're there to hear the invitation. Let me give you another one. This is really sad. Uh, we were having a revival meeting, and the preacher, <laughs> wow, did he preach a powerful message. And uh, when it came to the end of the service, we all were hoping that some of those people would want to become Christians. And so we sang the hymn of invitation, and 15 ladies got to walk out just as soon as we start singing. You know why? Because they're having pie and coffee after the service. And they have to go back into the kitchen and get everything ready so that the rest of us will not have to wait when they come. Now, I don't know about you, and you can quote me, and I can get in all the trouble I want to get into. <laughs> but I'm going to say it anyhow. Folks, I don't think that what we put in our stomachs should ever be compared to what we put in our spirit. Amen. What we put in our heart. And that just really bothers me. And yet it happens in almost every church. And you can tell what's most important. And then we miss a lot of other things. Not this. <laughs> They're going to take care of Mr. In-Between. <laughs> Got to fill it up. Uh, our priorities, we need to, I, I'm, I'm convinced that we send a message by what we do that's so loud that sometimes we forget what we say. They don't hear what we say. And they see what we do and they think, well, obviously that person doesn't consider that very important. Oh. Now, number four, what is the advantage of using Bible language to describe Bible things? Well, when you have the Bible language, you're not going to bring a bunch of baggage with you, which other people have added to words, and they make the words say what they want them to say, not what the Bible wants us to understand. So I think we have to realize that if we can describe something with a Bible word, and I think we can, we ought so to do, and then we're not going to get ourselves into trouble by the wrong usage that other people have made of that word. Now people can make wrong usage of Bible words, don't misunderstand me. But I still think we need to hang on closely to what the Bible has to say about that which we're talking about. Number five, is there anything in the New Testament to suggest that the Lord's Supper is the most important part of our assembly? You know how I feel, don't you? <laughs> You're free to disagree, but that's my position. I think that it's extremely important 
And I would never deny the importance of the Lord's Supper or the fact that it's totally essential and that to miss it is to disobey the Lord. I think it's that important. I really do. But to say more? Number six. Does Scripture prioritize prayer, preaching, singing, offering, and the Lord's Supper? No, it does not. And if the Scripture doesn't prioritize it, I don't think that we should either. And yet, and I'm not going to get any deeper than I'm already in. I know I'm in trouble already. But I challenge you in this list, I could predict just that quickly. If something's going to go, I know what's going to go first. And I can pretty well predict what's going to go second. And I can nearly always be right about what's going to stay in that list. We do prioritize. And I think that's a dangerous thing. When we assemble together, there's a pur there should be a purpose for everything we do. And I don't think we should eliminate prayer because we ran out of time to pray. I don't think we should eliminate the sermon because we spent too much time singing. I don't think we should talk so much we don't have time to sing. I think that every part of what the Bible intends to happen in a public assembly should be honored and should be given its due place in serving the Lord. Um, but I think that we prioritize. And it's just something for us to think about. All right. I'll try to straighten up before I come to class next time and not be so whatever. You did a great job. Oh, no. <laughs> All right, let's pray.